your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and I can tell you today, unless something crazy happens to me and I fall over, we will finish chapter 2 uh, this morning. Uh, this is what I believe the 11th sermon uh, in two chapters, and so we are being very thorough. No one will be able to say that we were not thorough through these uh, verses here in the book of Acts. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to pick up in verse 42 and work our way through the end of the chapter, verse 47. Acts chapter 2, picking up in verse 42. And it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and had everything in common, so they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. In verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, you must speak to us this morning. You must give us clarity of mind, of thought, of, uh, of action, of speech, of everything that we're hearing and we're seeing this morning because if you don't do that for us, we won't hear anything. We will be distracted. We will lose our concentration. We'll be focused on other things. And so, Lord, we need you to focus my mind first and then all of our minds here so that we can hear your word, that we can concentrate on it, that you will speak to us mightily today. We're believing that now. We're claiming the promise that, Lord, if we, if we speak your word or we preach your word, that your word won't come back void, that it will do something, that it will work in lives and hearts. And we're asking you to do that this morning. In Jesus' name. Now, last week... We saw the climatic ending to Peter's bold sermon. And you remember that Peter is preaching here in these verses right above here. Uh, verse uh, 36, Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So he's preaching to all of these unbelieving Jews. And he's saying, now you crucified this Christ, this Lord, this Messiah. Now, the Bible says here, down in verse 37, that they were pierced to the heart, they were cut to the heart, or they were deeply convicted about what they did. And then they cry out to the apostles, what must we do? Now, we talked about that kind of in depth last week, what must we do? That's kind of what we would love to see today is the heart of people hearing God's word to cry out and say, what must I do? And what does Peter say? Verse 38, repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we looked at this last week, and then 3,000, uh, about 3,000 were added to their number. Now this week we'll examine the fellowship that these early believers shared. Now, there would have been about 3,120. There were 120 disciples in that upper room, and about 3,000 were added that day. And so we would be somewhere around there. But as we pick up here in our verses, it says day by day that there were those added. So there may have been some added. There may be a little bit more than 3,120 people together. But I want us to begin with their devotion. They were devoted. Now, many people are devoted, but devoted to what? What are we devoted to? You could be devoted to a football team. I am devoted to the Cornhuskers. I love the Cornhuskers. And, and when season starts up, you will know it from me. And then uh, there are many people devoted to TV programs, certain programs that they love to watch, and they've got to see this program. And there are those that are uh, devoted to a club or an organization. Uh, Olivia Newton-John, I was thinking, going through this this morning, and I was thinking about a song that she had, Hopelessly Devoted to You is that song. And so people are devoted to many things, and maybe they're even devoted to people, and that doesn't 
sound wrong on the surface, but their devotion here, let's look at Scripture and see what these people, the early church, what they were devoted to. Verse 42 again, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Now, I want us to look at each of these individually. Now, first, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, this would have included what Jesus had taught uh, throughout his earthly ministry, and it would have also included uh, his 40 days post uh, resurrection appearances that he that he had made it would include all of that but these disciples are these apostles think about the sermon that we just went through Peter quoted many times from the Old Testament so he's quoting from the Old Testament so it would have included all of this now the New Testament hadn't been written at this point it's being written by all that's being done what we're seeing here and of course Luke recorded what's happening here so these apostles would be devoted to teaching what Jesus taught, what the Old Testament had predicted about Christ, as we see here from uh, what Peter taught from Joel and, and the book of Psalms. And they would have been devoted to all that he taught after his resurrection. But to see people today devoted to God's Word. Now, now we have Genesis to Revelation. We have all of this. We have what the apostles taught are we devoted to God's Word? Now, I'm going to ask the question like I asked the children this morning. Uh, are you basically devoted to getting up in the morning and, and uh, praying? And they were honest. Now, our question this morning to us, are we devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the New Testament, what Jesus taught, the Sermon on the Mount? Are we devoted to the Old Testament, to Genesis through Revelation? That is a question that we need to answer this morning because I hope and pray that we were if we want to be like the early church we must be devoted to God's Word now secondly they were devoted to fellowship now this literally means participation sharing they participated together now that's hard for us Americans to understand I mean we love our freedom we love our independence and so to think that I've got to be devoted to fellowship together, literally participating together, sharing. Now, this goes beyond just sharing our time. Now, we should share our time, obviously, from this text. You can see that they were devoted to sharing their time, but this would go further. This would go into material goods. Even their material goods, they were devoted to sharing it. Now, my question is, if we are never together, we're not really fellowshipping together, how do we know what people need? I guess we could call up the pastor, now that's cheating, and ask, what does people in your congregation need? I mean, you could do that. But we need to be together so we know what the needs are around us so that we can meet them, devoted to fellowship together where you understand the needs of those around you and this goes beyond just time again uh, devoted to sharing our material goods and we'll get to that here in a moment in a little more detail thirdly they were devoted to the breaking of bread now this likely refers to both the Lord's Supper and a larger fellowship meal John Piper says it this way he says that this here being devoted to the breaking of bread is unpacked in verse 46 now what he means by that is if you go on and move on down to verse 46, it basically explains what it's saying here in verse 42, uh, devoted to the breaking of bread. So he says, uh, he quotes here verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts. Now, John Piper goes on to say, Breaking bread might refer to the Lord's Supper, or it might simply refer to simple table fellowship, but partaking of food with glad and generous hearts shows that togetherness was a precious thing to the believers in the early church. They loved to be together at meals. It seems like they were together with each other in, the, in this way almost every day. That was the kind of love the early Christians had for each other when they stood in awe of God. Now, being together, I mean, you think about it, they were together almost 
every day. And that's one reason that they, there was probably a lot of selling their property and their possessions is so that they could continue to be together. You've got to imagine many of these Gentile, or many of these Jews, I'm sorry, were coming from far off lands. They had come back for Pentecost, and so they're staying there after their salvation, and so they need a way to stay. And so there are those that are selling and, and trying to help with the needs of those around them. They were also, fourthly, devoted to prayers. Prayers and house meetings and likely also in the temple, they were devoted to prayer. And I talk about this quite often. I want us to be a church that is devoted to prayer. That's where the power is in the Christian life. There will be no power in your life without being devoted to prayer. And that's why I'm teaching the children. So they learn at an early age to be in prayer constantly. You will see no power in your life. You wonder why sometimes, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I know I've trusted in Christ, but I don't see anything happening in my life. Are you on your knees? Are you crying out to God day by day? Now, I told the children a little time would be okay, but we need to spend more time as we grow older and we can focus longer. We need to spend more time in prayer. And I promise you, you will see miraculous things in your life when you are devoted to prayer. So they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, verse 43 speaks of reverent fear coming upon the early church. Now, I want to talk about this in depth. Verse 43, Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. The church experienced awe, awesomeness of God, reverent fear. Now, what I fear today and I'm not saying it here. I think that there is a reverence here. There's a respect for God here that you don't see in many churches. But I have been in many churches, very large churches, where I feel like that there's an irreverence there. Now, not necessarily coming from the leadership of that church, or I wouldn't have stayed there that long, but coming from some that are within the church. This idea, this attitude that God uh, or Jesus is somehow my buddy, my buddy Jesus over here. And so Jesus is my buddy, and we, we walk along, and everything's okay, and it doesn't matter what I do. Do you see how that attitude, and I realize that Jesus said, I call you friends. He said that to the apostles. I understand that. But there's a difference between friends and buddy-buddy kind of attitude. But when we have that attitude about God, all of a sudden, the holiness of God gets forgotten. We don't remember that God is set apart, that he's holy, that he's all-powerful, almighty, that he can be everywhere. Can any of us be everywhere? No. We're not all powerful. We're not all mighty. We can't be everywhere. We don't have all that power, all that knowledge. God is holy. He is set aside. He's not our buddy. A buddy would sit there with you if you were, if we were on our computer and we were looking at something we shouldn't or maybe on TV. A buddy might sit there and say, oh, that's okay. We all do that. That's not what Jesus would do if he was sitting there. Jesus would say, put no vile thing before our eyes. He's not our buddy. He is a holy God. Have you ever heard someone say, I serve the God of the New Testament? Now, we have to dissect what they're saying. They're saying that I don't serve the God of the Old Testament. Well, that's not possible. Because if you don't serve the God of the Old Testament, you don't serve the God of the New Testament. I can't remember how many times in the New Testament the Old Testament's quoted. It is a bunch, many times. I heard it this week, and I can't remember the number, so I'm not even going to try to stab at it, the amount of times. You see in this short uh, ex uh, sermon that we have from Peter that is shown here, he quoted from the Old Testament twice there, long quotes. You cannot serve the God of the New Testament without serving the God of the Old Testament. The reason that people say that to you is they think that in the New Testament, God winks at sin. Now, in the Old Testament, he punished them. Boy, he put them to death. That's, that's the thought process. God didn't play games. But in the New Testament, he's kind of, he's lightened up a little bit. That's kind of the, the attitude that you get from some. That's not true at all. It, actually, it is 
uh, more intense in wrath in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament. Think about Sapphira. We're going to mention them in a moment. Think about what happened to them. For telling a lie, they dropped dead. Ananias and Sapphira, and I'm going to say a couple more things about them in a moment. They dropped dead for telling a lie, not murdering someone, for telling a lie. Read Revelation if you want to talk about judgment. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. You can't serve one God and think, well, he's different now. He's not. The Bible says that he is a mighty God. He is a holy God. He does not wink at sin. Now, this awe or this fear was due to wonders and signs that were performed there. Now, these wonders and signs were performed by the apostles, not all 3,120 by the apostles, the 12. Wonders or miracles were being performed by the apostles that served as signs of the Spirit's power and presence among them. And many miracles were being done, many more than the few that Luke, the writer of Acts, records. Now, verse 44, we're changing uh, direction a little bit here in verse 44. It speaks of these early believers having everything in common. Let me read that verse. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. Now, please hear me closely. This is not an early form of communism or socialism. It is not. They did not sell everything and join a commune. That did not happen here. How many times have you heard pseudo-communists here in America? And it's so funny for someone to call themselves a communist in America, and they don't even know what communism is, and I'll get to that here in a moment. But to hear them talk about how this represented communism, it did not. First of all, the giving was voluntary and not compelled by the government. If you know anything about communism, the giving is compelled by the government. You give all that you have. Let's just say you have an acre of land. It is given to them. They delve out. You may starve to death on your own land. Communism makes everybody poor. It doesn't make everybody middle class. It makes everybody poor, but the few that are in charge at the head of it. Secondly, people still here in the early church had personal possessions because they still met in their houses, as you see in verse 46. It said they met house to house. They didn't all sell their houses. We also see in the New Testament that many other Christians, after this happened here, still owned houses. And you'll see that as we continue to go through the book of, uh, of Acts here. And then in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and I'm not going to mention all the verses, in Colossians and Philemon and 2 John, it's mentioned of believers having houses. They didn't all sell their houses and join a commune. And furthermore, Peter told Ananias and Sapphira that they did not have any obligation to sell their property and give the money away in Acts chapter 5, verse 4. They didn't have to do that. The reason they were put to death is they did sell their possessions, and then they brought half of the money and said they gave it all. Even if they would have gave half, it would have been fine if they would have told the truth. They were put to death because of their lie. They were not under obligation to give anything. So in contrast to communist theory, the abolition of property is not commanded. It's not even implied here. And if you want to see the truth behind the communist theory, get the book Tortured for Christ. And I've talked about that book a lot. Get that book, and you want to see what communism looks like and uh, you will tremble as you read of what communism does to everyone. Read about the evil behind such a theory. And in this book, you will see people who have actually lived under the theory, not people who benefit from a free market as we do in America and then espouse communist ideas as we witness in the West. How often can you turn on your TV and see that? Yeah, you might have it on Fox News or CNN and you see a communist and he's throwing rocks and he's screaming and hollering about Wall Street and about uh, what's going on with our companies here in America and you see them angry. You look at their clothing and you're like, boy, he's dressed pretty nice. And then you look at his, his, his weight and you're like, he's not starving to death. So he's living under uh, free market, 
living a good life, but espousing communist ideas. And the reason I mention so much about communism is I have read this book and what it does. It's deeper than just sharing your stuff. They throw God out. God is not to be in it. If you worship God, you're thrown into prison, tortured, your children are killed in front of you, you're, you're probably going to be put to death. It is a terrible, wicked thing. And the man who wrote this book, who was a Jew in Romania that I'm talking about here, uh, he was placed under Nazi rule to start with. The Nazis had come in. He said the Nazis were not even as close to how horrible the communists were. So that ought to give you an understanding of how wicked it is. And I want to make a strong point because we have a major issue in our country right now where it seems like we're headed down that path. And I don't think we understand how evil that path is now. On the other hand, I've said all of that, there is a voluntary generosity in sharing our possessions that's seen biblically as commendable. Verse 45 speaks of the early believers' generosity. Let's read that verse again. They sold their possessions and property, and they distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. So they were generous, not compelled by a government. They were generous because they loved God. Now, 2 Corinthians 8, 9 through 15 speaks of a believer's voluntary giving that brings much blessing to the believer now, I'm going to read this to you first, and you may not understand it, and when I finish reading it, I want to explain it to you so you understand the context. It may not make a lot of sense, uh, but it's 2 Corinthians 8, 9 through 15. Now, the Apostle Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now, again, that's 2 Corinthians 8, 9 through 15 for those who are looking it up. Now, I'm giving an opinion on this because it is profitable for you who a year ago began not only to do something but also to desire it, but now finish the task as well that just as there was eagerness to desire it, so there may also be a completion from what you have. For if the eagerness is there, it is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Verse 13, it is not that there may be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality. Verse 14, at the present time, your surplus is available for their need, so their abundance may also become available for our need, so there may be equality. Now, what's happening here is Paul has went to the Corinthians, those Gentile believers, and, he, and they're supposed to be taking up an offering for the Jews in Jerusalem who are poor and are going through all of the hatred of the non-believing Jews. You can imagine what they're going through, the persecutions. And so they lose their jobs, and they have no way to provide. And so they're trying to take up this, uh, this offering from the Gentile churches. And so he's saying here that verse 14, at the present time, your surplus, you have a lot, you have a lot of money, wealth, that you can give is available for their need, these Jews need, so they're abundant. Now, he's not saying they're rich. He's saying the abundance of knowledge that these Jewish Christians have. They have knowledge of the Old Testament. They can help you. So if you'll help them and keep them alive, they can help you. Now, verse 15, as it has been written, the person who has gathered much did not have too much, and the person who gathered little did not have too little because they were giving to one another. Generous. Now, if you go on down in 2 Corinthians in the next chapter, it talks about a cheerful giving. And so what Paul is saying to them is, I'm not forcing you to give, but if you really love the Lord and you have a heart for God and a heart for others, which you should, then you will give voluntarily. So he was not forcing anything. Now, this was one of Luke's great passions that Christians use their possessions for the needs of others and not just for their own selfish comforts. Luke alone tells the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Luke alone tells the parable of the rich fool who built bigger and bigger barns in Luke 12. The story of God's great banquet that people uh, wouldn't come to because they had fields and cattle to tend to in Luke 14. And the story of the dishonest manager in Luke 16 and the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. 
more than any other New Testament writer, Luke stresses the danger of letting our life consist in the things that we possess. The radical fellowship of our uh, verses this morning was antidote for the suicide of materialism committed by the man who built bigger and bigger barns and lost his soul. How foolish to store up treasures on this earth. The Bible says store up treasures in heaven that we should use what we have to help others, to keep them going, to not use it on ourselves as this foolish man who continued to build bigger and bigger barns so he could store up. And then one night his life is called, he dies, and all of that he stored up is either going to rot or it's going to be given to someone else. If he would have given it here and given it now and given his heart to Christ, he would not have been the fool that he was. Now verse 46 Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude. Oh, to see people thank God with a joyful and humble attitude today, to see someone even bow down before they eat their food, recognizing where their food comes from. But here in America... We have so much education. Well, I spent 12 years in school, or 13, whatever it may have been, 12 or 13 years in school. Then I went on and got my master's in college. I went and got my Ph.D. So now I can get a really good job and I can provide all that I need. Do you see the error in that thought that I did it, I did it, I made this happen? Instead of being thankful to God and saying, God, you provide what I need. Yeah, you provided me the mind that I could graduate high school. You provided me the mind that I could go to college and graduate. You provided me the job that I have. Believe it or not, people with all of that education lose their job. Can you believe that? Sometimes can't find a job. God provides what we need. We don't provide anything. If we would trust him and be thankful for his provision, Oh, to see that attitude today. Now, verse 47 speaks of these early believers praising God and God adding to their number. Let's read verse 47. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Now, one of the leading characteristics of true spiritual vitality, true revival, is this desire to spend time in worship, let me, if, if I use the word revival, let me define that word. Revival is not an evangelist up here preaching and a bunch of people getting saved. That is not a revival. They can't seem to figure that out in the south where I'm from. Every time you ever went to a revival, they had an evangelist there and about three or 400 people. I mean, there were large churches. People would get saved. That is not revival. Praise God for that. That's wonderful. But that's not revival. Revival, the very word itself, talks about re-something and that we come to life again. It's talking about Christians. Oh, that we would be revived by our love or with our love for God. And that desire, a leading characteristic of someone who is revived is their desire that they want to spend much time worshiping God. So obviously the opposite is true too. Those that don't really care about the worship of God, there's no revival in their lives. They are thirsty. They need to be revived in the Lord. Now, it talks about them having favor with all people. Having favor with all people. Now, I think that becomes a problem sometimes in the church, is that we can't seem to have favor with those around us. That's a killer. Now, something happened Friday, a really funny uh, story, or at least it was funny to me. And I was with my friend, and we were out fishing Friday. And we were on the lake, and I was in a kayak, and, and he was in, in uh, a pontoon, kind of a little kayak boat. And uh, this man came by in a boat, and we're in the swampy area, you know. And so I feel like the boats, and, and I shouldn't admit this, but I'm going to admit it. I feel like the boat should be out in the other area, that that swampy area is our area, you know. You feel like that sometimes, and that's not good for me to admit that. And so I see this guy coming in the boat, and, and, and I had just missed a couple of fish. And, 
and was kind of a little upset that I messed up and not brought them in. And, and uh, the guy comes by, the man in this boat, and he, he doesn't even really look at me. And I kind of looked at him a couple times to see if he'd say anything to me. And I was irritated myself, and I didn't say anything. And he drove on by, and I thought, why did that guy not say something to me? You know, and, uh, you know, he should have recognized I was here first, you know, or something. And I didn't mean for him to leave, but you know what I mean. He should have said something since I was there first. So he goes on by, and, and, uh, and I, I'm kind of a, at a distance from where uh, my friend is. And later on, we're back in the truck driving out, and, and I just, it just came into my mind, and I was kind of laughing and goofing around. And I said, you know something to my friend? I said, there was a guy that came in on a boat, and he didn't say anything to me. You know, I thought that was kind of strange, and I'm just being tongue-in-cheek, kind of goofing around about it. And my friend said something very profound. He said, did you say anything to him? And I started laughing, and I hit him on the shoulder, and I said, exactly. Touche. You're right. I didn't say anything to him. To be a friend to someone else, it, it's, it's about me. It's not about him, what he does. It's about what I do. What did I not do? Where is my love? Where is my compassion, my kindness? At least a good word. How are you doing? You're in the wrong place. You need to go back out there. <laughs> no. But, uh, but anyway, uh, that was a, a great lesson, and I thought about that a lot this weekend, and, and as I was going through the sermon again, I thought about that. Having favor with all people. And then thirdly, and the Lord added to them, here in verse 47, this again is an affirmation of God's sovereign rule or his sovereignty even in salvation. Since he alone can change the human heart to enable true repentance and faith. Only God can enable true repentance and faith. Now, my wife had an opportunity this week to lead a young person to the Lord. Praise God for that. God has to do that work. My wife didn't do that. God did that. He leads people to true repentance and faith. That's his work. Our job is to, to get out and preach the gospel, to teach people what it means to repent, what it means to believe and have faith. But it's God's job, and that's him that took that job. I'm not just saying, well, that's his job. I'm putting it on him. That's what it says in his word, that that's on him to save and to change. Now, in closing, let me ask, what makes all of this hang together? What's the driving force that made those believers free from their possessions, eager to meet needs, and full of gladness and generosity and praise and prayer when they ate together day after day? I think the key is found in verse 43 in that phrase, fear came upon every soul. A joyful, trembling sense of awe that you don't trifle with the God of the apostles. Now, that's not our experience very often this day. Today, most people, including most professing Christians, God's an idea for their talk or an inference from an argument or a family tradition to be preserved. But for few people, is God a stark, a fearsome, a stunning, an awesome, a shocking present reality? For most, he is tame. He is distant. He is silent. Where are the churches of whom Luke could say today, fear and awe, wonder and trembling is upon every soul? The absence of this fear has a direct effect on the way we accumulate our possessions for ourselves, the way we ignore the needy, the way we trivialize fellowship, and the way we play more than we pray. This is another reason why my heart longs for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in an extraordinary way. If that awesome teaching of the apostles would stand forth the way it was preached by Peter at Pentecost, and if the Lord confirmed this truth through his miracles and signs, this holy, happy fear would come upon the church and material possessions would become as nothing except to serve others. People, not things, would become precious beyond words. And when we met each other, we would meet God and prayer would be everywhere. But I'm afraid that we would rather play than pray. John Piper made that quote. We would rather play than pray. That is my fear that that's what's come upon the church today. 
Now, play can go beyond just playing, maybe being out fishing or whatever it may be. It can go beyond all of that. It can even go to work. Do we place our work? Now, I'm not talking about jobs where that's for Sunday. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we set things up. Well, I'm going to work on my yard. Or I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to do that and replace worship of the Lord. We would rather play than pray. That is something that we should be afraid of. God will deal with us ever so severely for that. We must put him first. And the worship of God, praise, reading his word, studying, hearing his word, is all a part of what we're to be about. Why is it so hard for us to be about those things? Why would we rather be doing something else? I'd rather be at a NASCAR race. I'd rather be at a Rockies or or whoever, or a game, or, or a football game, or baseball game, or football game, or whatever it may be. Why is that? God is first. That's what this life is about, the glory of God. It's not about our glory. There's plenty of time throughout the week. God gives us plenty of time. It's amazing. In our country, we have Saturday and Sunday off. Saturday to get everything done that you can't do during the week. Normally, that's not everybody, please understand me. But we do kind of have Saturday and Sunday. Saturday maybe for play or getting stuff done, and Sunday for the worship of God. First thing we do, I was talking to the children this morning about praying first. First day of the week is Sunday, and that's hard to, to get in your mind because you always think of the weekend. You think of Saturday and Sunday, and, and you don't really think of Sunday, but Sunday is really the first day. There's a reason for that. That's the way you want to start your week off. And I just am afraid that so many are not doing that, that they've lapsed back into the old nature, the old ways. And I'm calling us this morning to come out of that to make sure that we are serious about God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God right now, I long for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. I long for a true revival that Christians, believers, come back to who you are, love you, that we put away all of our things, that we put on Christ Jesus. God, I long for that, to see that. But you, again, that is like salvation. That is something that you must do and lives. You must teach us self-control, and we must live by it. Help us to. God, I pray that you convict our hearts, that you uplift those who need to be uplifted, you convict those who need to be convicted, that you bring us all to a right relationship with you, a right heart for you. Help us to understand fellowship, Lord, a love of one another, that we don't forsake the assembling together, that we fellowship together and love one another. Help us to do that, God. When we do, we will see the beautiful work of Jesus Christ in each life. God, I love you. I thank you for this day. Please continue to bless as we sing together. In Jesus' name, amen. As Karen comes forward for a last uh, song, a last hymn, the front's always open. If you want to spend some time praying, please.